Midwest Whitetail is brought to you by Realtree, Hoyt Archery, Muddy Outdoors, Fuse Accessories, Frigid Forage, Trophy Rock, Scentmaster, Cabela's, Rocket Broadheads, TrailCamPro.com, Bloodsport Arrows, Redneck Hunting Blinds, Scott Archery, Yeti Coolers, and Nikon. It's finally that time of the year when I need to get my cameras out and find out what bucks are on the farm. We did a little bit of filming uh, during the summer and I've got some good starting points. Uh, we filmed some nice bucks in a couple of different parts of the farm that were no doubt mature deer and uh, we filmed a lot of them that were probably a little bit too young to hunt. But now we've got sort of that uh, like I said, top level starting point, and uh, we're going to take it one level deeper now with the trail cameras. And for my buck surveys, I always use corn. Uh, I start with the trail camera over corn, uh, get the, the photos of the deer as quickly as I can, um, learn as much as I can, as quick as I can, and then get the corn out of there. And I always talk to the game warden every year, so he's aware of the fact that you know, this is what I'm doing, and he understands that you know, these aren't locations that are anywhere near where I'll hunt. You always want to check the regulations in your state because it's not legal everywhere to run uh, trail cameras over corn. But it does definitely help you uh, when you're trying to get that inventory quick to have something that concentrates the deer in front of the camera. Okay, so let's dive into this a little bit. Uh, this right here is a 400 acre piece of our farm. And I don't have a, a sense of, of how many cameras you have to have on a piece of property in order to you know, get a, a full survey. Um, the way that I've always looked at it is Every drainage and every part of the property um, that's distinct has its own set of bucks that live there. And they will mill around, especially during the rut, they'll cover more ground. But you know, I can basically say that on this end of the farm, we're going to find deer that we're not going to find on this end. You know, just on a 40, 400 acre piece, there are definitely home ranges that don't overlap on the bucks. So I'm thinking we're going to have camera starting here and the reason I want to start on this, this spot is uh, during the summer when the guys were filming back in here they did film a buck with a big frame and it was right at last slide and he was quite a ways away we couldn't get a real good sense of what this deer was but he wasn't the typical buck that we've been filming during the summer he was showing up there so again that's my starting point whether or not he's still in that area you know that he's shedding velvet breaking up the bachelor groups and, and filtering out into the fall ranges that remains to be seen uh, so we'll have one here, I'm going to run another one uh, down here in this bottom. So you're basically, you've got a whole like structure here of terrain and cover, whole other you know, set of, of conditions here. We're going to pull across on this side and we're going to run one right in this area someplace. And then uh, a fourth one is going to be on this side and possibly even a fifth one. And I've got eight cameras to work with, so I'll start with either four or five of them here and the rest of them on the other part of the farm and then once you've got a, a really quick inventory and, and have a good sense of, of what kind of bucks are in each area we'll pull these cameras and move them uh, more onto the rest of the farm so that's that's kind of the overview of, of how i do this next week when we start pulling these cards i'll talk more about what i learn uh, from the photos of the bucks that i pick up but really just want to get this thing started this week talk about the overall strategy of trying to find bucks uh, why I wait as long as I do, and then uh, the types of locations that I put the cameras on. And I would take that you know, one step further too. I like to run cameras in areas where there's already food. Uh, I don't like, especially when I'm doing an inventory like this with putting the cameras on corn, I don't like to have the camera in the area where there's no food because then basically you're distorting the patterns of the deer. Uh, if there's food there, you figure the deer are coming there anyway, all the corn pile does is concentrate the deer in front of the camera. Uh, for that reason, and also from the standpoint, is I feel like I can drive up to these spots. And the more spots I can drive to with my truck and set up, the better off I feel like I am. Um, purely from the standpoint of the intrusion. You know, I think coming in here during the middle of the day, driving in, uh, you'll see lanes through this farm. So the deer are used to our activity out in these open areas. You know, it's going to be exciting now. You know, we've got a lot to learn. Uh, every year we've got a lot of ground to cover. So that's the big picture plan, and now it's time to get to work. Got a 
another spot here, and I've got one of those same fences up that Scott Pruka showed in last week's episode. And this is the hot zone from Non-Typical Wildlife Solutions. It's a pretty economical and easy to set up system. I've got about three quarters of an acre fenced in here. It's right in front of this redneck blind. It's a perfect spot for late season hunting, especially for the kids. So that's kind of one of my priorities. You know, I, I obviously love to shoot deer too, but even more importantly for me is making sure that we've got some good late season hunting and some good uh, youth season hunting uh, for the kids. That's why this spot got the special treatment. It's probably something we're gonna do a lot more of in the future. So that gives you every opportunity to take a few little hot spots on your property and, and make sure that you get some uh, full uh, food plot growth going into the late season. This is an important spot for us this year because one of the bucks that we left on the farm last year that we thought would be you know, an honest to goodness big one this year was uh, the buck we nicknamed Splits. He came out here quite often. We had a lot of trail camera pictures of him right in this area. And then he uh, showed up here during that late season hunt when I shot Loppy last year. So hopefully he'll show back up again this year right in this area. So having this food plot here protected and producing a lot of forage for the deer and then as the beans start to dry down, uh, you know, it's gonna produce a lot of, of uh, just attraction to hold the deer right in this area during the October, November time frame. That's really important. Not only from the standpoint of creating the, the opportunities for the kids, but also uh, hopefully for anchoring that uh, big deer splits right in this area. I need to do some more work on this field behind me. This is right in front of the uh, killer stand. And as good as the beans look here inside the electric fence and even right around the edge of it, they look that bad uh, back there on that little narrow stretch of, of uh, food plot going back through there. So I'm gonna go into this spot. I've got the hand broadcaster and I've got the big and beastie. So I'm gonna go through and, and uh, hand seed this. But we're gonna need to get some rain here pretty soon with all this big and beastie that I've got down. I'm gonna have to get some germination and get some of this stuff growing. I want to talk a little bit about the cameras that we use and where we get those at because I think that has a lot to do with the success that we have when we're patterning these deer. When I first uh, looked at getting a trail camera sponsor, I was uh, not totally comfortable with any of the companies uh, that I had any contacts with because the reliability issues were always so cyclical. You have one really good year where the, all the cameras they got were you know, solid cameras and you get a year where they got you know, a lot of cameras that just didn't do that well. And I don't know, I just didn't feel like having our brand attached to a, a trail camera company that was gonna be unreliable and then our viewers are gonna be mad at us all the time. So instead, I went a different route and I contacted Rich Howell at trailcampro.com. He's a retailer, so he sells trail cameras. In fact, uh, trailcampro.com is one of the biggest trail camera retailers in the whole United States. And uh, he's got a lot of information on his website They've done a lot of reviews. They've tested a lot of cameras. You can go in there and you can get his unbiased test reviews. And he was the one that suggested that we work with Bushnell. Bushnell seemed like it fit kind of the profile of our viewer here with the price points that they have. You know, cameras under $200, highly reliable cameras. So that's kind of how we arrived uh, at the cameras that we did, uh, working with Rich and then now working with Bushnell. But we're really happy with these uh, Bushnell trophy cams for a number of reasons. Obviously the reliability is key, but also I really like this field scan mode that these cameras have. Basically all I'm doing there is taking a photo. Uh, in my case I shoot for the last hour and a half. So I'm taking a photo every minute for the last hour and a half of the day. There's two other features of these Bushnell Trophy cams that I really like. One is the fact that they have uh, fast trigger times. So if you have a deer walking past, you want to be able to get the, the deer in the frame so you can tell what it is. Uh, and then also a long battery life. And these cameras do really well on batteries. So anyway, that's our strategy. Um, it all kind of comes together uh, to fit into this method that we use or that I use for uh, patterning deer. You gotta have a good camera. Uh, it has to have the features that you need in order to do the things that you wanna do to, to uh, get a good pattern on a buck. So I've gotta get this one up and I've got, uh, I guess, five more after this to put up today. And, I'm about wore out already spreading all that big and beastie on these food plots, but I'm gonna get all this done today because we want to find out what's on this farm. It's important when you're putting these cameras out like this and checking them later to make sure that you're not leaving a lot of scent around for the deer to smell. And I have often worn a pair of uh, waist-high waders that Cabela sells for that. 
again. It was so hot today, I didn't want to put those on because I figured my whole body would be drenched in sweat if I had those waders on. So I just went with these Elimitrax boots, and these aren't quite as effective because they cut off at your mid-thigh. You know, the waders obviously go up to your waist. So if you're going through any amount of grass at all, it's nice to have that waist level containment. Uh, I would really recommend that when you're checking cameras and putting them out is to, like I said, the, the Cabela's waders would be num number one priority. And I think this company's out of business now. I'm not sure if Elimitrax uh, is still in existence or not, but anything along these lines that uh, keeps your pant legs from touching the grasses and the brush, because that's where you leave a lot of scent. It's not necessarily on the ground itself. It's on the things above the ground that your pants rub up against. I've got one camera left to set, and then I'm done for today. This is another one of those spots where we've got a buck that we're trying to find. It was a deer that Greg filmed during the summer, just a couple hundred yards from where I've got this camera set. And it's a deer that it goes back a couple of years on this one. We've got some history with this deer, and I wouldn't have immediately recognized him, but uh, Greg put the pieces together on this buck, and it's the same one uh, that Jordan missed during the youth season back in 2011. And uh, it was a nice 10-pointer then. I figured it was at least four years old at that time, possibly even older. And now uh, the only major change with this buck is he's gotten quite a bit more massive in the antlers. And he'd be a great buck to kill. He'd be. I'll bet you he's a seven-year-old, six plus for sure, and pretty nice buck. I mean, he's one of the better deer on the farm right now that we've been able to find. So if we can find him back again, that'd be great. Next week, I'll show you what we find on these cameras when you come back for the next episode. Well, I appreciate you joining us this week. We'll see you right back here again next week for the next episode of Midwest Whitetail. And remember to always dream big.